Hey, this is Caroline Gulls, and you're watching Pax 8 Live. This March, we have 31 days to celebrate Women's History Month. This year's theme for Women's History Month is women advocating for DEI. And at PAX 8, that rings true. Shout out to all the women near and far. Happy Women's History Month. I am so thankful to work with such incredible women here at PAX 8. As with most PAX 8 events, we get a lot of feedback from other MSPs, and that's very valuable to us to talk to other guys that do what we do every day. You guys want to see the future? The energy is electric. I am having the best time. This is my favorite part about the channel is the community. A lot of people, a lot of interest, mainly MSP focus, which is exactly what we were hoping for. It's about you, your customers, and their needs. We will be here for 2024. Looks like it's going to be bigger and better, and as PAX 8 always is. Greetings from Sydney, Australia. Happy International Women's Day. Let's inspire inclusion in 2024. Women's History Month went from one day to one week to one month. Happy Women's History Month. So proud of all the work that women do at PAX 8. Happy Women's History Month. Welcome back to the game. I'm uh, Dom Kirby. Matt Lee is off today, so I'm excited to bring on our guest, Rob Reck, Chief Trust and Security Officer here at PAX 8. And, you know, just want to remind you that I just obviously lied to you, and I'm not Matt Lee, and it's not a great way to build some trust. But we're going to be talking about trust and, and why it matters and why transparency matters. And as always, do all the, the things, click the like, subscribes, alerts, and uh, let's jump into the news, and I'll, I'll be Matt Lee again for the news. So. Let's jump over there. were used by senior leaders, so they kind of went on to say that it wasn't compartmentalized to any senior leader access in that regard. Um, and then in a response of who was behind it, they said, for security reasons, we can't disclose, which we'll get into that in just a second on not being able to confirm attribution. But um, IMF uh, lender made up of 190 member countries and international financial institution designed to stabilize economies by providing billions in funding to governments around the world. So this is a big, 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 big organization. They'd also been hit back in 2011. But that's really all they worked towards is saying the attack was so significant at the time in 2011 that they cut all digital connections to the World Bank. So um, if we want to cut back, I, I have some thoughts on this. Um, the first thing is it, it's evident they have a very healthy incident response process plan and, and methodology, right? I would just say just from an outward looking in, in my opinion, you have already a report within a month, right? So you're already meeting a lot of this, at least trying to be transparent, which we'll get to when I bring Rob on. But additionally, they, they had answers. They had the things they were willing to say and not. You also have a very interesting aspect of them not being willing to share any attribution. And I don't believe that's just because they don't know. If you have 11 accounts compromised, it was probably in a spear phishing or phishing type of attack some other type of thing that was quite targeted in my opinion. It's not like somebody stumbled on 11 different employees of yours in this phishing campaign. Um, this was a tar targeted attack. 
And then when you get into having these third parties and not being able to speak towards it, it might mean that there are additional takedown, additional n things that are they're not wanting to share uh, from that perspective. But the takeaway I had was, A, probably one of the largest influencers in money across the, the X, right, in the, in the world. Um, and then also just that we see a a very healthy, I think, and transparent response to what they have happening. They were able to say 11 accounts specifically, these were what was compromised. They did name it as a breach uh, going down that path. So anyways, uh, that's my, my thoughts on, on that one. Steve, can we grab the, the next article there? Awesome. Apex Legends. I don't know if any of you are play, players of Apex Legends, my son, and, and I play quite a bit, but EA, or Electronic Arts, has postponed the North American finals of the ongoing Apex Legends ALGS, or the Global Series, after hackers compromised mid-match during the, during the tournament. Like, literally in the middle of the tournament, uh, they were playing uh, in this match, and there was a remote code execution, right? So during the match three of the North America finals between these two teams, Dark Zero and Luminosity, the game client for one of the players actually popped up with a cheat tool. Like, it just popped up uh, with TSM Halal Hook, and the cheat interface was displayed on a screen, right? The ability to modify and select. And if you notice down there, there's one that was a, a type called Vote Putin, right? That was just obviously put in to have that camera effect and be seen. And the look on his face was horrified, right? Um, but the hack resulted in the player being able to see the positions of all of the players, which is the type of cheat tool that was being used against the anti-cheat system. They then struck again on match four because they went ahead and failed. Like, Luminosity went ahead and was the winner. So they failed it, and another person, Imperial Hal, another player, popped up with an aimbot that now was, was there. And so they actually were able to execute an aimbot. And I won't get into all the, the chaotic stuff that comes out of that later. We can kind of go back um, uh, to, to, to me, and let's just chat about it. But they talked about this being... Um, able to get past the anti-cheat software. They talked about it being an RCE or a remote code execution. That's the ability for me to do something from a remote place. Like I'm not on the computer. I'm not on the machine. But I am doing something from remote to allow that machine or to force that machine to execute some code. Now in this case, they had them execute a cheat bot. Why? For the lulls. Right, like legit for the lulls to have it pop up in the middle of a tournament that's televised, that's that's broadcasted, and have it pop up with a vote Putin uh, <laughs> pop, and using a cheat bot, right, making it so that I, as a professional player, would be seen as cheating, right. So there's a lot of the just the the, the lulls of it. Um, <clears throat> that said, though, when you think about it, what it meant, and what I'm so proud of, and I'll talk about this in my own family. My son is an avid Apex player. And he knew enough that when he saw there was an RCE, or a remote code execution, he has not launched his Apex ever since. And the reason he said that is, Dad, I know what that could mean. What could it mean? Well, I could run anything I want. And I have a very privileged place to do it. If you think about where an anti-cheat software runs that was purportedly at the heart of this execution, the anti-cheat software has kernel level in a lot of cases. It's really low. It's, it's a very, very low altitude in the ability to execute. Um, and so when you run something, let's say it's a piece of malware or a, rever a remote shell or something to allow me access to further my nefarious deeds and wants, then those things that I get running at high privilege mean I already start at a very high level. And so what I would use this for in the real world would be to deploy ransomware, to gain access, to gain foothold, to gain persistence, to expo explore, uh, to enumerate assets, things to that nature. Um, and all it took was a message. A message popped up from somebody and then the code executed, which meant they were able to use some, uh, abuse some portion of the system, which hasn't been really disclosed yet, um, to execute this. Um, and so it's just an interesting aspect of what happens when code testing, code regression, or these types of things aren't tested and found. And now if a threat actor finds it, it means I can do something big. And where have we seen this before? If you think about um, looking back to when Log4j and the Log4 shell capabilities started coming out, right? And this was about a year and a half, two years ago. The way John Hammond uh, actually demonstrated it was with Minecraft. <laughs> he just sent a JNDI message or JNDI or Java, Java naming uh, uh, index uh, command 
that was poisoned in the chat. And as soon as that ran, then Java's back engine would execute it and you'd have control of that server. And so you can do this by just seeing somebody in a game. If I just literally have the ability to text you or send you a message, I can do these things. So it's really big. Uh, and so I wanted to call it this one and spend a bit of time on it um, also. And let us know, if Dom's not here, I feel a little lonely. So like if you're out there, like put some messages in the chat uh, so that we can see them. And I know you're there, but uh, all right, next news article for me, please, Steve. Okay, uh, everybody says that Macs and Apples are never hacked and there's never vulnerabilities. Well, uh, a newly discovered vulnerability in Apple's baked in, baked in to Apple's M series of chips allows attackers to extract secret keys, right? Like, like my actual handshake keys uh, that are stored in the trusted platform module from Macs when they perform widely used cryptographic operations. Academic researchers have revealed in a paper published Thursday, which is always better when it's academics first, hopefully. Uh, the flaw, a side channel attack, right? A side channel we'll get into later, allowing end-to-end -end extractions when Apple chips run implementations of widely used crypt protocols can't be patched directly because it stems from a micro-architectural design of the silicone, the way they did the chip itself. And it can only be mitigated by defenses in either third-party cryptographic software that could actually degrade M-series performance, or by them making changes probably in the M1, M2 generation physically in the chip. The threat resides in the chip's data memory dependent prefetcher, right? A hardware optimization that predicts the memory address of data, like says, here's where this is probably going to reside based on this running code, where it's likely to access in the future. By loading those contents into the cache that's before it's needed, then it makes it faster, right? As a conversation, that way the CPU, a common bottleneck, uh, is not a problem in this, in this situation. So security experts have long known that classical prefetchers open to a side channel attack for the malicious processes to probe secret care material operations, but this vulnerability is really a result of the prefetchers making predictions, right? So without beleaguering you for the rest of that read right there, it's about this predictive behavior that's been done. And this isn't the first time. We've seen other examples of these kind of prefetchers, predictive behaviors coming into play. So I guess the point is, is really if you're running Apple M1, I don't have a takeaway for you. There isn't a solve. It really is just right now, understand that there is an academic belief that this could be exploited. Um, the nice thing about academic belief is it's usually in extremely controlled scenarios and conditions, and it's often not released. And I'll give you a great example. There is a side channel attack to FIDO tokens, if anybody's not aware, right? And so I can take advantage of Google, if it was, if I remember correctly, it was a Google token uh, that had an underlying chip, that you could take that FIDO token, my, my, my you know, cryptographic key that proves I'm Matt Lee, and you could take that key from me, get it out of my hands, take it apart, put wires on it, do a million transactions, and discern information about the key pattern to then get to the seed code. So the, you could theoretically beat this system. But it means you had to carve it in half, take it away from me for two days. I don't have use of, like there's a lot of functional problems even though the academia has defined that there is a scenario for it. So what does it mean? Really just make sure you stay up to date on patches. And also if you are, are leaning heavily on the performance aspect and ratio of Apple Silicone, you might expect there may be challenges in the future because the patches that look like that would come for this are likely going to impact performance by disabling the key thing that was made to increase performance, if that makes sense. So we've seen this before on several Intel fixes. It's not like this is new to Apple, um, but just wanted to bring it up. And it's also a great time to talk about the fact that we, we've heard for years, and this myth is hopefully fairly dispelled at this point, but we've heard for years that Macs aren't targeted, Apples aren't targeted, they're secure, we don't have that problem. And I'll bring us back to this statement asked of a bank robber once that said, why do you rob banks? And the answer was, well, that's where the money is, stupid. Right? And, and the point is, is that why did we have so many more fundamental flaws in Windows and fundamental flaws in, on that side of it? Because that's where the money is. That's where people are transacting business. But as more and more people transact business on Mac and on Apple hardware, you will start seeing and have seen over the last few years more and more vulnerabilities pop up that, that are targeted because of that's where the money is uh, aspect of it. So I've got some awesome words from Robin Harris. She's giving you some great resources if you're going down the ISO journey. So if you're paying attention and you're heading down this compliance path, uh, she's got a couple of really good things in there that, that actually won't cost you a billion dollars. Uh, so I love hearing from practitioners and Robin specifically. Let's cut over to Robin Harris and we'll come back with our guest that I'm super excited, Rob Ray. I would like to talk to you about a couple of resources that I have personally found extremely useful. I mean, I'm telling, get this book, 
Take this course, the ISO 27001 ISMS Handbook and Control Book by C's Vandervins is a wonderful resource for anyone looking to implement the standards newly into their environment or transition from the 2013 version into the 2022 version. And I think this particular resource does an excellent job of sort of painting a picture of, this is what the standard says, this is what it anticipates, but this is how it's gonna really look in a real environment. And when you look at the 27,001, it seems like they didn't make a lot of changes. But when you start looking at the controls that are supposed to be pre-existing, they've actually tweaked them and they've actually leveled them up and they've introduced new concepts and they've gotten very specific where in some areas they were more vague. So while it seems like there are just 11 new controls, I think if you are going from the 2013 version to the 2022, you're going to find that some of your existing controls that you were satisfying, you're going to have to do some work on those. And I think having a resource other than just the standards themselves will support you bringing that language into a real work environment and actually being able to have meaningful conversations with control owners so that they know what is expected and they can assess their readiness to be audited against the new standard. A companion resource that goes perfectly with the ISO 27001 standards is the ISO 31000 standard, which is a risk management standard. It actually does a great job of peeling back how do you evaluate risk in the context of ISO. And you can get a wonderful course on Udemy by Abraham Gluck. And he gives you some insight on what didn't make it in versus what made it in versus what you need to think about. And this course was being taught in a university setting, but you get the benefit of it without having to take a university class. And it really lays out some things about risk management and how to conduct an assessment. And it is an excellent companion for 27001, even if you're not going for that certification, because risk management is a part of 27001. The course is entertaining, um, and it just gives you some really good insight on how to think about risk in a real business. All right. Robin Harris, and, and you know what's interesting, Robin has been a consultant to Pax8, she's coming in and become an internal employee to Pax8, and now she's been a bit of an advisor to you all, right? I think she's done like 40 of these for you, so I'd love to see some comments, like how has Robin helped you specifically level up, right? I'd love to see if anybody can speak towards that, and if the answer is ISO 27001 or ISO 30, I just want to throw things at you, but I still love you. Uh, okay, so I'm super, super excited about our guest today. Uh, Rob Reck is going to join me here in a minute. And, and it's almost like a little fanboy aspect for me in this regard. Of He's got a history in this world and, and taking companies to drive exactly these future-facing concepts we're going to talk about today. And so I, I want this to be participatory. I'd love if you're in the audience to chat on YouTube. I'd love for you to ask questions. Um, throw the hard-hitting ones. I may or may not answer, ask them. But uh, Rob, come join us. Let's let's bring Rob Reck in. What is hey, up, Matt, man? Thanks for having me. Uh, I got. I, I feel gotta like start I'm off by saying, air. Well, Matt, I got to start off by saying that Robin is on my team and she's awesome and she does such a good job, not only telling other folks outside the business but inside. She helps Pax8 make sure we're compliant and meeting the requirements of our customers, just like our partners can do. Um, and um, I, I learned a little bit just watching that as I, as I got here. But thanks for having me, <laughs> yeah. I've, Matt. I've, I've obviously you know got to know you uh, over the last several months, and I think this is a really cool thing, and I'm glad to be a part of it. 
Yeah, it's awesome. And, and we try to highlight security leaders and also just thoughts that are, that are something we want to kind of advance and talk about. And so having you here today to do this, you know, you've run your talk show forever. You've been involved in the enterprise community. You've been involved in the enterprise security community for the bulk of your career. Um, but I want to talk about trust, right? But first, what I'd love for you to do is, Rob, why don't you tell the audience who you are, a little bit about your background, uh, and, and what do you do for PAX 8? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've I've only been at PAX 8 for what's it? it's been about four months now, um, and I'm the chief trust and security officer here. I think we'll spend a good amount of time here talking about why that title is important, why it was important to me, and I think important to PAX 8 as well. Um, you know, but going back further in my career, I've been in IT and security for oh, like 25 years, something like that, a little <laughs> bit more now. Um, started, I started actually at one of the, the news companies this week. I, I was uh, uh, a, a tech, su tech support guy at Electronic Arts, and my job was to make your video. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So my, I did not so plan my, that. Uh, my first job out of, uh, out of college, you know, I, I, I mostly helped walk people through installing new sound card drivers to get their video games to sure. run. Uh, but it also helped people build boot disks to, to run your Jane's flight simulator or what, whatever it was. <laughs> anyway, you know, fast forward, nice you know, IT guy for, uh, for IT guy for you know, eight or nine years, uh, up the kind of typical path, you know, I was a network admin system admin, uh, and about 2006, sure. be, I became a, a security guy, like a security guy for a little SaaS company. Back then we called it an ASP application ser uh, service provider. And, uh, and yeah, maybe I was, I was in that space for it, it, between software and banking for about a decade. And, and then I made this okay. change in 2016 into the, the vendor side. Um, I was the first CISO for Ping Identity, which is, as you mentioned, an enterprise focused identity security company. Uh, yeah. I was there for about five and a half years. We were a venture capital uh, back company when I got there. We, we got bought by private equity. We ended up going public in 2019. Um, just an amazing run and opportunity there. Um, a lot and of then learning in, uh, there. Yeah, imagine. oh my gosh, so much learning. And, <laughs> and I, a, a, lot of, a lot of my perspective on, on trust and what a security department, what, what a kind of next version of security needs to look like comes from my experience at Ping and, and, and being able to meet the needs of, of those customers. Uh, and then I spent two years running security and some external facing um, security work for, uh, for a company called Red Canary, which is a managed detection yeah. and response company. Um, and then I took a little bit of time off and um, got the opportunity to join PAX 8 and super excited to, to get to come in here. You know, it's interesting. I want to rewind back to that moment you got the and security. And I'll tell a little story. I, um, I, and I think I told you this at dinner one night. But I, I, I had my badge for when I was the director of technology, and the name was written vertically down the left side of the badge, right? Or this that left side of the badge, my right, but the left side of the badge. And one day I got assigned to be the director of technology and security. And I was just yeah. handed a little sticky note that wrote and security down it in vertical letters that was stuck to my badge initially. Like genuinely, I felt like it was just handed it. And you brought up a similar story, like you kind of walked into yeah. security from an engineering background in that same way. Did you have a similar yeah. kind of uh, experience there? Yeah, I, I'll give you a couple. My, my first exposure to security, I worked at, an, at a public oil and gas company. Um, in 2003, and that's when Sarbanes-Oxley requirements came at us pretty hard, and and there were there were Thanks, these. Thanks, Enron. Hey, <laughs> I mean, it, it, this is all maturity, right? It, it's all it's all good stuff. Yeah, true, and, true. It, and it opened up an opportunity for me to to be the one who embraced helping with access controls and other, and other um, security requirements that came along with Sarbanes-Oxley. Yep. So that was my first exposure to it. Uh, I also did a couple other pretty technical things in that role, like setting up. The, the SSL VPN, setting up the wireless, setting up the, the, yeah, the yeah. BlackBerry Enterprise server, and all of them had their Ugh. own security angles, right? Um, so when I went to my next Three people role, just died when you said BlackBerry Enterprise <laughs> server right there, by oh, the way. Oh man, kept that Bez running. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, continue. I, I, I guarantee you that there are some Bez servers out there that are like oh, yeah. still bulletproof, still still chugging along. <laughs> um, so then I, you know, my next role when I, when I went, when I went to that ASP company, they, they 
they needed someone who could make their customers feel confident as we had access to all their customer information. And and I said, I've never done it as my primary thing, but that sounds like a lot of fun. And, and it really was, it, it was a lot of fun. And it got me out of this, you know, the command line technical part and, and more into right. you know, trying to solve problems that, that were honestly like externally, um, externally dictated requirements. I'm going to bring you back full circle to this though. The statement made was they wanted someone to make their customers trust them on the security that they are placing in their hands. I, I just want to let that sink in for a sec because that's literally the focus of this conversation today. Yeah. And I thought it was weird. You know, I knew you came in as the new CISO to replace our outgoing chief information security officer. But you chose a chief trust officer title. And, and I think there's some maybe conversation playing into that. So let's start with that. What is, what is, what is trust? What's a chief trust officer? Yeah. What does it mean? What's different there? Yeah, I, I think that it, there, it is not a well understood position in the industry. So I'm going to give you Rob's perspective. There are, there are other folks who, who have the title and I've got to know many or maybe most of them. And, and it's a little bit of shade different. I, I'd say one of the earliest ones, um, Malcolm Harkins, uh, he okay. they really, really has helped to push this forward. But my perspective is it's not necessarily about doing a different set of things, although it, it may in some places trust means you also have privacy. Some places it, it can mean other things, um, but it's not necessarily about that. What it really is to me is it's changing the conversation from a conversation around how do you do technology in a more secure way, which is what I think the word security kind of brings around, whether you say cybersecurity or you say information security, um, yeah. it's rather than just talking about how do I do technology in a, in a more secure way, I want to have a conversation around how do we act? How do we treat data and systems and access in a way that preserves the relationship with our key stakeholders? How do I make decisions not focused on reducing the likelihood of a, an attacker getting in, which is of course incredibly important part of the game but it's not the only yeah. but it's not the only important thing right it's also important right. to understand what am i what do my stakeholders care about what do they expect me to do with my data so matt i want to i want to just talk through how i pers my, my own personal like journey to get here you know at, yeah, let's do at, it. At, i'll say at ping you know we we served mostly fortune 500 fortune 100 companies and they would right. just barrage me with requests for on-site audits, fill out these questionnaires, do these uh, do, do these um, co contractual obligations. And what I realized during this process is there is no such thing as enough of those things. Like they, no. they will never feel like there's enough because they don't work. The, the reality is you can ask someone to sign a contract, you can ask them to fill out a questionnaire, you can go do an on-site audit. None of them are really gonna change the behavior of that, of that um, vendor. Um, to be clear, I think Ping did a great job, and I'm not. I'm not suggesting we didn't. We, we did a really good job, but the reality of their questionnaires didn't change much. What I what I really realized is what they want to know are some fundamental things. They want to know, uh, as a as a as a partner of theirs, do we have adequate resources to secure their environment? Do we have executive yep. buy-in to ch to make changes across the environment? Do we have a risk a risk based approach that understands the biggest risks and are we working through those risks because we have resources throughout the business to do it? Let's yeah. say that those those three questions are really what they want to know, but they can't ask those questions because everyone would say, "Yes, of course I have those things." We're so good. they have these got governance, no problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they have all these like proxies that they use, contracts and audits that try to get to the root of it. So once I realize what they really want to know are these few things, well, let's figure out how do we show them those things? How do we show sure. them that we are properly resourced and we care? Well, we talk about what we do. We talk about what our resources look like. We talk about how we approach things and, and we show them you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly when things go well. And it, it turned into this whole model that's based on, hey, and, and uh, Matt, the, the big three things for me, and I, and I think you and I have talked about it a little bit, but re, I have three big, core tenants to, to what make privacy, or excuse me, what make trust uh, key. Number one, it's having a one-to-one -one say do ratio. If I say I'm gonna do something, I do it. I, I make commitments sure. that I live up to. And then the flip side of that is if I'm going to do a thing, 
I just let you know in advance. Now, happy surprises are wonderful, but what happy surprises don't do is build trust. It doesn't make my okay. word more you know, stronger. Every time I'm gonna do a thing, I should let you know in advance. And now you see there becomes this such a strong connection. Rob said it, it happened. Rob said it, it happened. And you, you go far enough, you have, well, yeah, if Rob says it, it's gonna happen, right? And, and yep. that, that's yep. a big part of building trust. And, and I'll be Which really the honest, one-to-one like, say do and the prediction of what's going to happen correlate, right? Those aren't standalone items, right? Because you have to they, no, they're, not, they're, not only know, yeah, yeah, you have to do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. To your point. It, yeah. It, it, yeah, it, and of course, there's there's always going to be changes. Things happen. And, and this is kind of where the second one and comes failures. from. Like, like, yeah. fa exactly. Yeah, I mean, fa failures. Yeah. Like, like I, I thought it was going to come. Here's why it didn't come. And so the, the other side, or the next step of this is, is what I call proactive transparency. And it's the willingness to have hard conversations and, ha you know, a yeah. conversation, hard conversation that I could get away with not having. You know, if if I have an yes. internal <laughs> security thing that that maybe no one outside would notice, it, I, I can I have a choice to make. I can choose to um, to hide it and go fix it on the back end and hope nobody notices, or I can choose to air my dirty laundry and say, let me show you how we failed, how what I'm learning from it and how I'm gonna get better. And by being yeah. willing to have that hard conversation and make sure that the right stakeholders hear about it, now now all of a sudden, those people say, man, if he's willing to share this with me, I I, I can really trust that, that when he tells me a thing, like it's going to be true. Now. This sounds really easy, but it, it can be really hard. And this proactive transparency is a place where you'll run into challenges with, with legal, you'll run into challenges with, with sales. You know, hey, we're gonna embarrass ourselves a little bit because we made a mistake, but we're human and we, we're humans who are willing to let you know when we make mistakes, right? It's a really important thing to me, this, this um, proactive transparency and the willingness yeah. to have, the, have those hard conversations. So you have one is one-to-one, -one Right, say do ratio. Right, if you right. if you say it, it needs to be explained and done. Two right. is this radical, if you will, proactive tra transparency and proactive conversations, yep. good or bad, in that com in that conversation. Proactive, meaning on purpose, not hey, guess what? I found money. Uh, to your point, um, right. And so, what's number three? Because I've got a lot to unpack just in those yeah. first two, yeah. <laughs> in this first piece. But yeah, what's number three? Uh, aligned incentives. If, if you think about what the experience you have when you walk into a used car dealership or any car dealership, you know, walking in that the person who wants to sell you that car has uh, the opposing uh, incentives to you. They want to get the most money out They're of not you. Not sitting on your side of the table. The car possible, yeah, yeah. right? And and that puts you in an adversarial relationship. You can like each other, but you know you're here to beat each other up, right? And what what I what builds trust though is to say we are going to win together. And, and I, I'll tell you that, this is a really big part of why I was excited to come to PAX 8. We have really great aligned incentives with our partners. You know, we make money by selling things through them to them and that they make money on, right? That's how that's how right. winning goes is, is where, you know, every time they sell a thing through our marketplace, you know, a little bit goes to us, a lot goes to them, good for everyone, right? And, and I yeah, love yeah. having those aligned incentives. And like, Matt, you're here because we want to make partners more successful because that's good for us, yeah. right? Like, I, I yeah, love Yeah, I'm that. certainly like, not carrying a sales number that's justifiable, right? So there's, it's yeah. only, we want to educate and empower these partners to succeed. And it's, it's just it. yeah. so exciting. And like- Oh, and, Jack and Scott's just, here. Okay, sorry, I had to say hi. Jax, what up? Good seeing you, sorry. Continue, Rob, I, I apologize. No, I love it. Uh, and it's just, there's not a lot of companies where it's easy to make those incentives so well aligned. True. But I, I think it's really it's true. clear, it's important to look for it. Like, as you're engaging into a relationship with someone, how do we sh how do we structure this relationship so that we win together, we lose together? Like we're on the same yeah. page and every step of the way. And then I'll, you get those three things together. Like, isn't that what trust looks like? At least that's where, where my model right. is today. It says that those three things it. look like a pretty trustworthy person. Well, and, and let's let's unpack those maybe at a business level from a traditional security role. And and first, let's go back and start with like, where have we come from, Rob? Like, let's let's say this. Number two is talking about radical transparency and protect and proactive transparency. If you go back ten years in your career, I don't know about you, but that was never going to happen. If you rewind even five years, we had major players in our in our world suing security researchers for talking about what they know to be true. You had people and board members saying, you can't talk about this. When our event happened in 2019, Rob, I was threatened with a lot of lawsuits if I was to speak about what had happened at our organization by our private equity partners, right? We had this absolutely no 
Uh, not until I get your last check, right? Ultimately, <laughs> I tease. But, um, you know, the, the joking aside, hasn't that changed? And how much has it changed in the last 10 years in certain security? I think that you're, you're pointing out one of the big flaws that we had as a security industry was this unwillingness to share. And and I have seen in my community um, just a, a 180 degree shift, right? Where where people yeah. like we, we've recognized that it's really hard and that we are not reinventing the wheel. Let's go, let's go talk with other people who are trying to solve the same problem. Um, this impression that, you know, from many of the CISOs, including previous bosses I've worked for who just didn't, you know, they weren't comfortable sharing. They felt like there was some kind sure. of competitive intelligence, maybe that their security program had I, operational man, like, security risks yeah, based on the statements was. being made. Yeah. 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 What, whatever it was, I, I, I don't, I don't know that I ever bought it and I definitely don't buy it now. Like we're, we're better sure. when we're helping each other get better. And, and the, the bad guys are certainly helping each other. Right. And, and so this, this willingness to make a change, this is a big thing I've seen. And there are lots of communities all over you know, in Colorado where I am, we have a, a we have a great community of security leaders. Um, I think that as people have found folks to cling into and, and really use to get better, like that's where we see, that's where we see lots yeah. of improvements. Somebody finds a cool thing and they start to see that replicated other places. Yep. hundred percent. So when we think about this, this transparency part, it's things like, you know, when you looked at during the Solar Winds event and the Microsoft source code exposure that happened in 20, I guess it would have been 2020 uh, during that time frame with the Solera gate and that expansibility, that's really the first time we started seeing companies come out and say, hey, I got compromised and there was a major problem. And it goes back to your point of this saying things that you could just as easily get away not saying. Right. You could just there wasn't somebody threatening to extort them. There wasn't somebody out there saying we have this source code. None of that has ever surfaced at least as I understand it, most of it has really just been, we were compromised. There were threat actors in our system and we've seen it now two or three more times. And now we have gone from, you know, you bury it and hide it as much as you can, whatever the breach council says, I don't have to say, and then you were done. And now you're literally having an SEC form to fill out, right? Within four days of, of knowing what's going on. Like what a difference in that change and how that yeah. changes from your perspective. How does that play into trust? Like talking about the stumblings, talking about the incidents, talking about the things where we need to be better. Is that a component of that transparency in your role in trust? Yeah. I mean, if you think about the companies who, and, and I, I'm not super comfortable naming the names of the ones who've done it very poorly, but there have been some who've done a very it's, bad it's fair, job. It's fair. I try to be um, nice of, to the nice ones. <laughs> uh, uh, of, uh, of, of talking about their incidents. Um, and when you think about those folks and then you think about the people who have been really straightforward about it, you know, coming out of it, which of them do you think are most likely to go fix the those systematic problems? The one who talked oh, about their is. systematic problems or the one uh -huh. who 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 hit it under the rug and you go, well, do they even know they had it? Or, or you know, sometimes they let's let me blame my partner who 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 made this mistake. Is It was their fault. Well, no, it's, it's never their fault. It's it's always your fault. Right. Like at the end of the day. You can't outsource the liability and the and, and the accountability mm -hmm. for the the data that you host for your customers. No, no matter who's who the partner is that makes the mistake. You know, understanding those mm -hmm. fundamental things, being able to show here's step by step what happened. Here's how we're going to get better. And by the way, we know this is the tip of the iceberg. We know there's more stuff for us to get better at. It's true everywhere, and being willing to acknowledge it. The person on the other end reading that that update. They're not, they're judging you. They're saying, yeah, it's true for me too. I'm going to try and take your lead and get it. Ah, there we go. And there we go. I think if we're honest, close your eyes. Anybody watching this right now, like just close your eyes. I want you to humor me. Picture in yourself. Have you ever said, my client sucks and they won't do the things I want them to do for MFA. I can't believe they won't take the advice I'm giving. I'm so frustrated. Okay. Have you also said, I wish my vendor cared. I wish my vendor would do these things. They don't offer us, they're not doing the SOC 2, they're not getting, but have you looked in and said, how am I on those things? How many of you have looked introspectively? And I think the reason this transparency lands so honestly, Rob, is it's us being honest with us in that, that rare moment when Rob Reck stands up and said, we had a major problem, this is our stumbling, this is where we got better. I, in some little bit, get to be forgiven for my own challenges and I get to reflect on them, reflect on them and go, gosh, I can learn from Rob. And I think to your yeah. point, it's that transparency and, and, and um, genuineness 
and honesty versus obfuscation and hiding. And to your point of who am I going to trust the most? It's the one that told me they sucked yesterday and they're going to be better tomorrow. Because guess what? I suck and I'm going to be better tomorrow, right? And I think it's that humility. It's that honesty. It's that, uh, yeah, Jack said, don't close your eyes if you're driving. Touche. I may have set some people <laughs> up for some in, uh, inadvised risk. Uh, Touche. But I do love that that transparency and honesty and, and, or, and organic being able to do that and fight through those layers internally is something that would be endeared by customers today that would not have been the same yeah. 10, 15 years ago in my mind. And it, it just allows deeper relationships, right? If you think about in your own, in your personal life, the, the people you have the best relationships with are folks you've been through hard stuff with, right? If you try and take care of the hard stuff on your own, you don't expose them to it. You're not <laughs> yeah. giving that relationship the chance oh, to, to get deeper. And, and like, you know, is, are, are they, are your relationships strong enough to handle it? Maybe not always, but man, I, I bet you that you're, you're, that more of them are than you think. And that, yeah. that the way you get those strong relationships is by being willing to have those hard conversations. And, and they're certainly not strong enough to survive you lying to them and them finding out. So <laughs> let's put it that way, right? So let's yeah. just take it that great assault, maybe for the temporary penny, penny foolish, right? Uh, and I got guilty from positive energy. Thank you. At least we're honest with ourselves, right? And I, I'm honest with myself about that. I have failures that I have to be better at every day. We all do. All right, so we tackled sure. number two just because it's the most endearing to me. The say-do ratio, right? Your one-to-one say-do ratio. How does that play out in execution for you at a PAX 8? What does that mean? Yeah. Like, try to take that into some more tangible examples of this one-to-one say-do ratio. Yeah, I'll say there's there's all kinds of different ways that that, that needs to show up. Uh, within the team that I run, you know, I'm building an organization that – as they make commitments to me and to each other, they, they take it seriously. Right? If I tell you, Matt, I'm going to be on the game. Like I, I get a little yeah. like something in the pit of my stomach that says you made a commitment. You got to do it. And, and if, if the thing, if the thing's going to, you know, I get a sick kid, whatever things happen, but you let them know immediately you, you take it really seriously. You and, might and, say and you ask, have proactive conversations about those things, even if they're hard, that might be an argument you're making there. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Got back to that proactive transparency. Oh, for sure. And they they do tie together. But this willingness to say, when I make a commitment, it really means something. That goes a long way. And I ask my team to do that, not just to me as their manager, but also to other stakeholders in the business. If If someone asks you to do a project and you say you're going to do it, like, you schedule that time you're ready to do it you're ready to support that thing and and so you, you ask like what does it mean to pax eight you know this is a thing that, w- that i'm trying to figure out right now exactly how can i help as we're talking about product roadmap as we're talking about how we engage with our partners how do we make sure that we are giving them visibility because visibility is key to being able to build that trust but at the same time n- not restricting our ability to like to make really good pivots when we need to right there's a balance to be made but i think it's important and i think it's worthwhile and and you're, you'll see you know at you'll see you'll see things coming on this soon i'm working you know to get some some visible um, a visible trust page for us. I'm also looking at getting a trust yeah. blog built out, give you guys visibility to what's happening across the the MSB, the channel space around security. Matt, you and I will be working together on that. You know, fair, I think fair. getting getting better and better at sharing those things is is a big part of it for me. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So one to one, do what you say. And there's two parts. I mean, there's a couple ways to unpack that, right? Because it either influences me to not to commit to things I'm not going to do. Or it influences me to strive to achieve things no matter what the failure around me becomes, <laughs> right? And I think that's the, the two kind of things. And we see this play out. How many of you, I mean, don't close your eyes again because Jack said, said I might kill you. But like, imagine how many of you have said something that you knew the minute it came out of your mouth, you weren't going to do it. Be yeah. honest with yourself. How many of you have committed to things that you knew for a fact there was no chance of that happening? Maybe even it's just one you punted, right? How many of you have sat in an IDS meeting for attraction and said, hey, boss, I'm going to crush that. And I'll point this out on myself right now, Rob. How many times have I said to you, I'm going to write that article that's my responsibility for our group meeting? I knew I was not writing that until I got done with four more conferences, two more work group meetings, five more things. But I could have had radical, proactive conversations and, and could have been better at that to the point. So I'm just saying, as you think through this, when you focus on, as a company, doing what you say you're going to do, it makes you more focused on not committing to things you know you cannot do, and it makes you more successful at delivering on what you say you're going to deliver on. So I don't want to miss that there's two halves to that coin. 
right? Yeah. Uh, and I also simultaneously told myself for not bringing my homework, but that's okay. I still I, like it. And I and I'll Matt, you, you make an example of that that engagement we had, and, and I'll tell you. I made a commitment to writing a thing and I didn't want to do it. You know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to do yeah, this yeah. thing now. Yeah, but, but you wrote right yours. <laughs> right? Well, exactly. Uh, like, anyways, because, because of this, right? Because I, because I expect it from other people, I, I feel like I've got to do it, right? I've got to be the, I've, I've got to be the thing I'm asking people to do. Yeah. Anyway, like yeah. there is, there is so deep you can go here. Um, it's, it's a combination of, of, marketing and and product and legal and everything Amen. all wrapped into how do you how do we approach yeah. it from from my perspective it's just like be it be a person of high integrity and do it publicly there you go right that's what that's a good way to boil yeah. it down that's one and two that's that's one and two right is, is what you just defined which which brings us to to three and i think you kind of tackled this but aligned incentives incentives you know Alyssa miller who came on our show before and you've, you've probably seen her around and talking but and she says that the language of business is profit. It's not risk. And that risk is simply a translation of stuff that people have already accepted. Like for the most part, people have already taken on risk when they decided to be a PAX 8. You had the risk of what we're doing. And yes, there's micro transactions and things we can choose to change. But when you think about this um, aligning incentives, how does the traditional no department of security in the way it was seen in the past live in an aligned incentive both internally to make sure that Pax 8's doing the right things and that the incentives to be the right corporate player, to be the right partner exist throughout, starting from that security position. And, and so I'd love to focus in on just that aligned incentives at the microcosm of being a chief trust officer inside of an organization and ensuring that that works inside your corporation, your your, your organization. Yeah, I, I, I think you're getting to one of the root challenges of security is how can can I be effective and also not be the department of no at the same time? And there yeah. are situations where it's actually impossible. So if, let's say that I started today and the release date for a new thing comes today and they say, hey, can you do a review of this thing? And I review it and find it, you know, riddled with vulnerabilities. Yeah. I have two options. <laughs> right. I have the option to be the department of no or to be completely ineffective at my job. Right. Those are the choices I give myself right. because, yeah, of, because wow. I didn't get it early enough. So, so then you just take that, that paradigm and just take it to its logical conclusion. The solution is not to be at the end of the process. The solution yes, be is earlier in the process. To, be, yeah. to be all the way at the beginning so that like even before the process starts, and let's say you're talking about releasing a new product or you're talking about releasing a new service if you're one of our partners, um, before you've even you know started designing the, the 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 product or the service you go you go put secure architecture in place you you make you know your identity and access management work you you make these other fundamental things work so whatever i build on it is going to be more secure and then as i start thinking about this new thing i want to build you don't have to go buy, hire a consultant to go tell me what's a secure architecture looks like just start applying yeah. some 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 common sense things as you're writing your requirements for the thing, as you're thinking, ideating the thing you're going to do, putting security requirements in at the very beginning means I'm not having to do rework. I'm not throwing it to security after it's done and saying, is this good enough? I've built sure. it the right way from the beginning. And so you ask, how do I do this as a chief trust and security officer? Well, I do it by build, building out a team that goes and gets integrated early, not at the end. I need people to know what's yeah. coming, make sure that we've, we're building things right at, at the beginning. It goes back to one of the things you said, I think that's probably the most poignant, which is, you know, what are the three things people really wanted in all those organizations that were asking you questions? And it was to know that you had the right resources, to know that you gave a crap, and know that you knew what you're doing, and that you were going to go deal with the things and fix it. So they're trying to get down to as that core result in the beginnings of this whole, you know, chief trust officer in conversation. And yeah. what you're getting at is these aligned incentives of moving that desire that secure left is also a motion we're seeing in our world of this shift towards governance and the understanding of governance. Right, Rob, if we look at NIST CSF 2.0, it's got governance as an overarching theme for all of right. them. As we look at many of these things, we're seeing that the missing point has been the give a crap. The missing point has been that the incentives were aligned and the teams were driving forward and that you had a voice in the organization, Rob, that you could actually influence product design and decisions. Mm -hmm. and. And I, I'd love to have you speak on that shift and in, intentional shift to governance and how that automatically pushes you left, right, in this yeah. in this conversation and earlier in the design process. 
Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more that governance is key and governance means understanding some basic things. I, I think it can, it's a, it's a scary word and, I, and I'm, I'm nervous about sure. pushing it too hard with this audience because sure. it can, it can feel like we're saying, well, you got to have some kind of a big framework and you got to have, you know, a 200 gotcha. page policy document. That's not what it means. It means that you need to make some decisions before, you know, some pre-decisions before you go in and start making designs. Like how, what's our risk look like? What kind of data do we want to have? Just make some decisions as a team that allow you to yep. go faster later. Right. I, I've decided that we are going to tokenize any any payment information we get. I don't know. Come up with whatever your decisions are. Yeah, whatever front. that decision now, requirement is. Yeah. Yeah. Like you have five or six key decisions. I actually have uh, previous organizations. I've created a, a set of core security and privacy tenants. My, my tenants are, nice. we will always, we will reduce access in this way. And you write like eight or nine of those things. You say, hey, what is, how does this feel to you, other members of the team? Does this seem right? And everyone says, yeah, those, those are right, or let's change this. All right, now everyone gets it. Let's go train the org that these are like the, the eight things you should think about when you're, when you're architecting a new, a new thing. And they go, oh, those are easy. I, I can make sure I put those in my requirements. And now you've short-circuited all of this like rework you yeah. have to do later. And you call that governance. Yeah, yeah, it is governance. It definitely is. But it's not painful. Sure. It's it's freeing right. and it's easier than having to do it later. You said it right. It's enabling, right? If you know the lanes you're supposed to drive in, you know what that road's supposed to look like and you know what cliff it's supposed to not go over, right? Then you can pretty much be free to move forward rapidly and not have a moment where you've got to put a CISO in a position of Sophie's choice to either be ineffective or say no to this in this aspect. So yeah. that is truly aligning those directions and aligning incentives uh, at, at that early stage. And it is freeing. I think having governance is freeing, um, even though it doesn't feel like it in the beginning. <laughs> I guess is my point that I would add to it. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and, and not, well, it depends point. on what kind of governance you're talking about. Like you can start with a really lightweight set of governance. And, and if you think, what I'm saying is, is is worse or harder. I just want you to put yourself in the shoes of that developer who says, I need to do this. I don't know how to do it securely. I guess I'm going to yeah. take a guess, right? It sucks right. for them. They, they don't want that. They, they want help. They no. want support. If you can just give them these resources up front, their job is easier. Their stress level goes down. Amen. Yeah, they can make and design what they want to make and design, right? They want to write the code, make yeah. something cool. That's right. Uh, and at the end of the day. Well, Rob, I, I think one of the last things that I really wanted to tackle with you um, was this understanding of, you know, we focus on security as the goal, right? As if I can somehow codify the fact that I'm now secure. Let's not even <laughs> tackle that whole problem. But the, is, it, is the goal security or is the goal trust? Does trust create security as to, or does security create trust? And I, I forced you into a chicken and an egg question, but... Yeah. Which one comes first, trust or security, and are they how are they related? So that's the seven. Yeah, well, they're they're, de there, brother. <laughs> they're definitely not the same thing. I, I can, I can trust someone who I don't believe is is secure. I, I think that you can you can and and probably do right. Like it, within my sure. life, I. I I, I can trust that you're doing your best and man, you're really bad at security, right? That's, that's possible. Sure. Yeah. Um, but it's, fair. it's very, fair, very possible. <laughs> and, and if, and if, if I acted in a trustworthy manner and I said, let me show you all of the stuff I'm bad at. And you go, Whoa, you're bad at a lot of stuff. Like that's not what secure yeah. looks like. I say, yeah, okay, that's true. And here's how we're making progress. That, that is, that is one version. You know, the other, the, the, the I don't actually think they're necessarily um, hand in hand, but you, you can't have, I think you probably cannot have trust without um, knowing you're you're moving in that direction, right? That people have the sure. right intentions, that they're trying to get you there. So there's there's yes. a correlation, but not necessarily a, a one a one or the other. But I don't think you can have security without trust. Help me understand no, if I'm can, wrong can, there. I don't know. Like if you think of a three letter agency that that uh, that we think is probably pretty secure, but we don't trust them at all. I, I think they probably exist out there. <laughs> okay, other than those microcosms, I think if I was to be a business that, that says I'm secure but will never transparently share that, will never be yeah. proactive about communications yeah. and don't have aligned incentives, then I, 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 that's my argument is can you, can you have it without that? And I, I'd say 
hyperbolously maybe no, but you're probably right. Uh, so, There's more than one example than three letters. So my, <laughs> I, and I, I've, I've got years of thinking this through. So you, you get the, you get the advantage of having to hear me talk about it. That's the whole point. I, yeah, I love it. I know, right? Um, that not every company does this make sense for. I think that when I, when I okay. look at a, 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 a company that is. Um, manufacturing, good example. Like we're making widgets. You know, we're we're Acme company delivering things to coyotes, and and and, and, and they're gonna buy, buy from my mail order, whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> Those yeah. things they do, they really don't care what my security is. Like honestly, they just want to make sure that they get a thing from me. That is not a company where building a trust program like I'm talking about makes a lot of sense. And there are a lot okay. of companies like that, to be to be fair. The companies where I like think it Amazon, makes the most sense. Even, or for like delivery of goods well, the, that are- I Amazon, guess, yeah, the retail. Information. Yeah, not AWS. The retail not element, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay. But the, the companies that, that I think are, are really important for trust are companies that are we, very strongly web enabled. So you think about you know security vendors. You think about IT providers like our like our partners. You think about um, companies like your your CRMs online. These these things that we depend holding massive on. data that's valuable, that's line of business systemic. Those type of things. To your point, yeah. If they if that company goes away or is owned, what is the impact to my company? If the impact gotcha. is I go to another commodity provider of, of, of widgets, um, then I don't probably need to have a trust program. If the pro if the the answer is I go out of business when Salesforce goes down or when Salesforce loses all my information, well, Salesforce was one of the very first companies in the world to have a trust program for that reason, right? Like they are right sure. in the in the center of, of of this thing, and and I think they're the perfect example of a company who needs it, and there are. There are whole industries that don't need it. So I think it's worthwhile to think, I think where we yeah, are, who fair. we're talking to today, it's probably really important to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think maybe it goes towards how deeply and systemically you are part of the delivery of their world, right? And and when you go to those web yeah. deliver companies. Um, and it's more that way because uh, unlike before, let's say someone made me a piece of software that I ran inside my organization. The, the data still lived here at least in the most part, right? And I still had control of some of those things. And even if they went out of business, I'd be like, well, I can probably still function in my ERP. I can still, but when you are literally depending on me to be the flow for your applications you're buying and billing and all of those components, then yeah. And it also is probably correlatable to the amount of data and the risk and value of that data that is harnessed there as well, right, Rob? In, in, in that yeah. need for a trust center? Yes, so exactly right. And I would say if I am off, am I offering IT services to a small and medium business that will go out of business if their billing system doesn't work, if their if what, yeah. whatever whatever technology we're offering doesn't work, like it's it's core to them. And they may not, they, they almost assuredly don't know this language, but they know the feeling, right? They know the feeling yeah. that I've got someone in my corner who I can trust to deliver True. and tell me when something goes wrong and and is not looking to make a buck off me while I lose a buck. Like if they, if they feel that from that partner, like that's the relationship that's going, that they're going to be least worried about. Right. It's the one where they think it's a transactional thing. And how do I know that they're going to make sure my systems keep running? Do they really even understand that if this goes down, I go out of business, you know, that, that, you know, aligned incentives and, and common knowledge, I think is just so key here. You, you know, it's funny, I, I didn't expect to go off on this tangent, but you know, when MSPs became MSPs, it was for the same reason. It was the yeah. argument that you only call me when things break, so I'm actually disaligned with your incentivization. I am the person that gets paid when you are suffering. Uh, and if you will pay me monthly, I will do proactive things to make it to, to where our incentives are aligned for you not to go down and me have horrible hours. So you like, Rob, you've really nailed the exact birthplace of MSPs in this statement, and I didn't expect that to come out of this. That's hilarious. That's awesome. Um, That's well, awesome. So uh, one of the other things that, that I, I kind of wanted to end on is I, I don't know if when you become a cybersecurity person, at some point you just get jade infusions and you become jaded in yourself. But I, I think what's interesting about why trust matters so much, if you believe, like I do, that we all suck at this, and that companies have made money on crappy software, poor development processes, lacks of vulnerability programs, lacks of ability to actually manage and keep trust in that way, 
then it'll be those that you just trust, like Rob said, that are the ones that I believe will make it out of this. I'm only looking for the ones that I believe will change. When we're dealing with CompTIA Trustmark, ironic, but when we're dealing with, and I'm on the advisory board for CompTIA Trustmark, we're trying to just determine, is that MSP capable of getting where they need to be? Not, are you there? Because nobody's there. We're trying to figure out, can you get there? And trust goes a long dang way into that. Right. And this understanding of do I believe that Rob and his company are incentivized to develop and be secure, are incentivized and aligned with me to drive towards that action? And are they being one to one, say do and being transparent and proactive with us? Rob, I I don't know that I could have planned to run a show better than just this conversation went. So I'm I'm great. Do you have any closing thoughts for people out there that are watching? Steve, Sven, great seeing you. Are you, do you have anybody out there, any, any closing thoughts on trust? You know, I, I'd, I'd say, I, I do have one more thing. As you were talking, got me thinking. The I think there's been a trend it, we, we've I, we've seen, you and I have seen for years, that the bigger a company gets, it seems like like the less trustworthy they are in a lot of ways. Yeah, they start to and, fall over at the top, right, from that regard. And, yeah, and yeah. I... I think I think it takes a really deliberate, um, de- deliberate management, executive management direction to say, you know, this is important to us, and and I and I think there are some good examples. I want to, you know, I'll, like I said, I'll call out Salesforce as one. Like I went, like them or hate them, they have re- worked so hard to be trustworthy in this way, and and I think it's key. And you know, we're 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 here to do it, right? We're here to make sure as we grow that we we are trustworthy. We continue to be that company, and I want to help our partners do the same thing. You know, I'm I'm very sure. focused building my internal program right now. But in the future, you know, we're going to get out here and we're going to help as much as we can. And I'm looking forward to that, Matt. Well, come join me. There's plenty of stage time. So thank you all so much. And, you know, it's it's going to be awesome. Uh, Rob, I really want to thank you for being here. I know your your schedule is inundated with these hundreds of meetings of trying to get things where you need them to be and understanding. So I thank you so much. And I'll go ahead and close this out. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate you. All right. I want to be uh, extremely excited. I'm always excited. I guess it never really goes away, so I apologize. But Alex Spiegel is joining us next uh, next week, and she's going to come and talk with us about compliance from SPs. But she's also another one of those members out there creating what is Trustmark and what are the things that we need to be adhering to and what are these standards we should all follow uh, in that regard. So come join us next week with Alex Spiegel, uh, and then we'll be here every Friday on YouTube at 2 p.m., Mountain Time, and also kick in some thoughts if you think Wednesdays might be better. You never know. So thank you all so much, and we'll see you next week.